No, I appreciate the invitation to, to come today and be part of the uh, part of the scientific symposium. Uh, we spend a lot of time going out on the road talking about things that are, are not as scientific, so this is kind of a welcome, uh, a welcome shift. I'm going to move quickly so that we can get to the questions, because I'm standing between you and all the things that you wanted to ask the other speakers. Um, I will have a statement of disclosure that I'm a shareholder at Organovo. Um, so, uh, Xiao Chen talked already about 3D printing and additive manufacturing, and you know, I think I would just point out that there's been a pretty big transition of those technologies into the life sciences space in the last decade or so. Um, you know, certainly things like the Invisalign braces, those are 3D printed, you know, about 1,800 of them a day, I think, in, in some shops. Um, and then we are getting now to places where things like these skull um, uh, skull implants are being 3D printed and then actually implanted with the intent of having them stay in the body and integrate with the body. There's a company called Oxford Performance Materials that's doing that now clinically, and I think that's pretty impressive. Um, and so these things are kind of coming to bear. Um, and if you go back to uh, what is now a long time ago, 2003, when uh, Dr. Boland first took an inkjet printer and, and put some cells in the cartridge and demonstrated that you could actually inkjet print with cells, it kind of sparked the imagination of a lot of people, I think. And beginning then, very shortly thereafter, people began taking cells and fabricating things in three dimensions with automated technology. And that's really kind of been the birth of, of what we call bioprinting. And if you look at the number of publications that are out there today, it's a, it's a Jimmy Fallon worldwide trending topic. And uh, there's now 188 publications, over half of which now have really been in the last year or so. So people are getting the, the picture of this is something that you can do things with that haven't been possible to be done before. So there's a lot of people kind of investigating that space. Um, I think it is worth a moment to talk about what is bioprinting, and I'm going to go a little bit into the type of bioprinting that we do at Organovo. There's a lot of ways to go about it. We have a particular way. I'll share a little bit of that with you, but what I mostly want to do is jump into a couple of specific applications where we're, we're using stem cells to achieve something specific um, because of the audience that's here today. So when I think about bioprinting and when the scientists at our company think about bioprinting, we're talking about working with something that's making a three-dimensional object that object is, is fabricated with an automated piece of technology. So if you take a 96 well plate or a 24 well plate and you make 24 of them, they're the same. And they're spit out by an instrument that's making everything the same. And that's part of the value. When you think about what can you do with an instrument that lays down little pixels of tissue, if you will, part of the value of that is taking two different types of cells and patterning them relative to each other. And so we also feel that having some type of architectural component is part of the value. So being able to create and recapitulate spatial positioning analogous to what you would have in a tissue is part of the, the, the coolness of the technology. We don't do anything with a single cell type. No tissue in our body is a single cell type. And we spend a lot of time patterning with two, three, or four more cell types. And I'll show you some examples of that. And at the end of the day, what you've made is interesting, what it does though, after you've made it, is what's really important. And so we focus a lot on figuring out, okay, we printed this thing, it looks really cool. Does it do anything that mimics native tissue? Because that's where it really, you know, in, in my opinion, where the rubber hits the road. So talking a little bit about the platform that we use, uh, we use an internal, internal instrument platform that was developed uh, based on some technology that came out of the University of Missouri uh, back in 2004. Um, and uh, what we're uh, really doing is starting with lots and lots and lots of cells. Laura talked about cells. We don't use a lot of materials in the way that we print. We're focused primarily on cells themselves. And our bio ink, what goes onto the printer, is typically all cellular or mostly cellular material that can be um, configured like a very long filament or like little aggregates. And the printer itself will lay those down in a pattern in X, Y, and Z axes and yield a tissue. And if you think about the tissues in our body, um, we have, for the most part, in our solid tissues like liver, and I'm going to talk about liver today, uh, most of the tissues in our body, the cells are touching other cells on all sides, mostly, or the matrix that the cells have laid down themselves in the tissue. And if you think about printing with hydrogels, which we can do, um, you can use hydrogels to create void spaces to provide physical supports for tissues in the first 24 hours or so that they're printed, kind of like a co-printed mold. 
if you're trying to develop an intricate structure. Um, you can incorporate some cells into the hydrogel, and this is what it looks like if it's 10% cells. This is the amount of cellularity you get if it's 35% cells, which is getting to be high. And this is why the resolution is where it is. You can't take that much cellular material and put it out of a tiny little orifice. The cell, the shear forces uh, damage the cells, and they, they can't be printed. We do a lot of work with liver. They're very big cells. They're very fragile cells, and so the resolution limitations come from that. But we can also print things that are 100% cellular. So pretty much if you're trying to make a tissue, like we focus a lot on making tissues that are going to be used in vitro as models of human tissue in vivo, in the body, the cells are touching other cells. And so if we can fabricate things at the time that they're printed pretty much to recapitulate the cellular density and the architecture of the tissue as it sits in the body, then the time it takes for it to mature and become something that we can use functionally is just shorter. So Adam mentioned context. I'll harp on context a little bit. I think uh, I kind of I came up in the reductionist molecular biology area of my doctoral training, and, uh, and that worked well for me for a while. But then what you figure out after a while is when you take hepatocytes, take liver cells, and put them in a 2D monolayer on plastic, they don't really give you a response that's anything like what would happen if you looked at that cell within a tissue, and certainly not if you looked at what happened in that cell in an organism if you were, say, to give the same drug or the same stimulus. And at the end of the day, the way the cell responds is governed, maybe it's 50%, maybe it's, that's an opinion, maybe it's 90%, by the context in which you ask the cell that question. Um, it, you know, they're kind of like teenagers. You put them in a different environment, you get a completely different outcome. Um, so if we think about 3D printing and what you can do, uh, you know, the, the beauty of it to me and what got me so excited that I, I plucked up and moved here from North Carolina three years ago um, was being able to, to kind of conceptually pick a, pick a tissue apart and say, what are the components of a tissue? And here we're looking at some uh, kind of a mock-up of a, what would be a, a breast cancer, for example, with little islands of epithelium embedded in, in fibrovascular stroma. And then in the, in the breast in particular, there's a lot of adipose tissue. So the idea that you could actually kind of take this structure and at an impressionist level, it kind of break it into little voxels and then use the printer to make a crude uh, replica of that and then let biology kind of take over and, and finish up for you. Um, and so this is what that looks like um, if you take a cross section of these. And these are quite large. They're well over a millimeter in size. Uh, because they're printed with a the printer, they're very reproducible in architecture. And what we've essentially done is take this fibrovascular adipose stroma and surround this little epithelial core of, of cancer epithelium. And uh, here you can just appreciate the morphology of it. Now, one of the things, this is something a stem cell is doing for us. So you can't print with adip adipocytes. They're, they, they float and they're full of fat, just like you can't print with bone cells. There's a poster out here today that you can go learn a little bit about how we're, we're doing that. Um, but you can print with preadipocytes, and then once those are in the tissue, differentiate them, stimulate them to go on and form adipocytes. And so this is how we get adipose in the tissue. And you can see with the oil red O staining that we can get adipose in this uh, adipose tissue formation in this stromal compartment that surrounds the epithelium. We also have breast fibroblast and CD31 cells that are making microvascular structures within that stroma. And so we can begin to model things that are relatively complex and control the architecture. If you've ever played around with multicellular, multicellular spheroids of, of cancer cells, a lot of times the epithelial cells sort to the outside of that multicellular spheroid over time. So if you go to hit it with a drug, you're going to hit the epithelium first. That's not typically what happens when you actually test the drug in, in, in vivo. So how we use these today, how we're beginning to use these, is being able to take things like, like drugs, specific drugs, and ask what happens to the tumor cells in the context of these three-dimensional structures that we can print. And so here again, you're looking at the little um, epithelial core that's in the center of this cross-section. This is a cytokeratin stain. This is a very uh, simple um, hydrophilic dye that's permeated the structure. This is methotrexate, which is also um, hydrophilic and has permeated the structure. And here's paclitaxel, which is very lipophilic, and it's sitting on the outside, uh, you know, kind of trapped in the stroma, trapped in the fat. And this is something that's very difficult to model if you're just using a monolayer system. Um, and so what this enables us to start to do, so if you look here um, at a cisplatin response, and you just ask the question, you know, if I take these cells or I take this tissue and I put cisplatin in the system, does it kill it? 
is there evidence that cells are dying? And the, the answer that we get here looking at this three-dimensional tissue compared to the MCF7 cells in 2D culture, you would say, yes, the tissue is dying. But now you have this little piece of tissue, and you can actually go take a biopsy of that and look at it, section it, and look at it. And what you find is the cytokeratin 8 positive epithelial cells are really not dying, and there's lots of cell death, which are the little green dots here, the tunnel staining and the stroma. And so you can start adding drugs into the system and then asking the question in a compartmentalized way and say not just, you know, is this biochemical effect happening, but which cells is it happening in and what is that doing for me therapeutically? So moving on to uh, another tissue that we've done a lot of work with, which is liver. Uh, we have, uh, we're pretty far in development with a product that will be coming out looking at uh, bioprinted livers in, in preclinical toxicology applications. These tissues have a compartmentalized um, architecture as well, where we've taken elements of the liver stroma and separated them spatially from the hepatocytes themselves in a pattern. Um, in three dimensions, there are hepatocytes there, there are hepatic stellate cells there and endothelial cells there, all human. Uh, we can maintain these tissues for at least six weeks in vitro with viability and function throughout that time. And we're beginning to study the, and model drug effects in these tissues now. And you can see, because they are so cellular, the tight junctions that form between the hepatocytes in the tissue and these Desmond-positive stellate cells that sit within the islands of hepatocytes that form over time. So the first thing we did was really look to say, well, if you were to take known hepatotoxins and expose the tissue to them, uh, what would happen? And so if you take a drug like diclofenac, which is a 3A4 inducer, now here we've taken a tissue that has been maintained in vitro for 14 days and then uh, hit it with the drug. And so we're looking at induction of 3A4 activity, but as the dose of the drug goes up, you see LDH come up signifying damage in the tissue. You can do something very similar with acetaminophen, which is a well-known hepatotoxicant. And if you now look at this biochemical data and say, well, I have a problem, you can take that tissue and section it and actually see the necrosis that you would see clinically if you were to have a patient come in who had overdosed on acetaminophen. But the real proof is when you can take a drug that uh, does have a problem in the clinic that was not predicted by animal studies and not predicted by traditional 2D culture systems and say, well, can this system actually differentiate? that toxic drug from a non-toxic drug. And here we had a test case where we were given two structurally related compounds, one that had a safe profile, uh, which is uh, compound Y, and one that had a toxic profile, which is compound X. These were not predicted in rodent studies, not predicted properly in 2D studies of hepatocytes in vitro either. And we were able to see the effect and differentiate that in the, um, in the 3D printed tissue. And so this says to us, you know, this has a value beyond the systems that are in use today and kind of, uh, you know, gives us encouragement to keep looking forward. And that's where the stem cells come in. So if you think about the ability to go from using primary hepatocytes to maybe cells from very specific patient populations, uh, disease populations or patients, uh, specific segments of patients that you might want to do some selection before you go into a clinical trial, for example, and uh, we've taken cells from cellular dynamics, the I-cell hepatocytes from cellular dynamics, and just asked the question, can we take the hepatocytes out and put the I-cell cells in in their place and still get tissue formation and still get function? Um, and so we get nice glycogen deposition in the cells when we do this. The morphology looks really nice. We still see the formation of microvascular structures just like we would if we were using hepatocytes. And we see function that's preserved over time in the 3D printed structures, uh, perhaps a little better than you would see in just the 2D cells maintained in co-culture with the other cell types. And so what this opens up the possibility for is not only having renewable and consistent supply for just a standard product, but you can start looking at heritable disorders, looking at susceptibility to particular populations. You can do fun things like recombination studies. If you're interested in the mechanism of action of a certain type of disease progression or drug, you can look at that with a chimera made of part normal cells and part disease cells and start picking apart at the cellular level what's driving the pathogenic outcome. Uh, you know, in a particular disease population like alpha-1. Um, and so this becomes a very compelling, uh, I think, value proposition. And the, the only thing I will end on, and then we can get into some fun discussions, is, you know, we, when we look at any new problem, whether or not bioprinting addresses it or not, it really is about the quality of the inputs that go into the system. If you don't print with the right cells or you don't print without, with the right architecture or design, you're not going to get anything functional and interesting. And we've done lots of failed experiments. 
Uh, that's the other nice thing about an automated technology. You can try a lot of different geometries. You can try a lot of compositions and see which one actually resonates from a functional perspective. Um, and then we have to ask the question, does the architecture of the tissue really fit with the limitations of the instrument platform itself? That's an important question. And then once you've made a three-dimensional tissue, how in the heck do you get the information back out of it? Because now you've got three different cell types. It's, it's very thick and large. It's hard to pick it apart from the molecular level, you know, kind of using reductionist approaches. So these are all the challenges going forward, and I think uh, we all agree that the significance of this technology will really, at the end of the day, be driven by the applications that come out of the, the tissues that we create. Um, and then poster number 23 out here will have another example of some IPS-derived mesenchymal stem cells for bone formation. Uh, and Edwin Golez will be presenting that today out here on behalf of Organovo. So thank you.